Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jam, Baltimore. This is Reality Asserts Itself. We're continuing our series of interviews with Gar Alperwitz. Now, this series is going to be primarily about America After Capitalism, which is a book that Gar wrote. And we're going to take a look at what his thinking is on that. But Gar, as we learned from part one, and if you haven't watched part one, you should, uh, he wrote a PhD thesis and then a book that led to a whole reopening of the debate or discussion about just why America dropped the nuclear bomb that ended the war with Japan after in World War II. And we're going to do one segment on the basic in, uh, outline of, of that thesis and a little bit more about how that affected his thinking. So thanks for joining us again, Gar. Thanks for having and you. one more time, Gar is the Lionel R. Bauman, Professor of Political Economy at the University of Maryland and the co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative. He's also the author of several books, including America Beyond Capitalism, The Decision to Use the Atomic Bomb, and his most recent, What Then Must We Do? Straight talk about the next American Revolution. So thanks for joining us Good, again. Thank you. So let, let's jump to the chase about the bomb. Your basic thesis was that Japan had already essentially was, was ready to uh, uh, negotiate its surrender and the bomb was not necessary to end the war. The, the contrary narrative is the bomb saved thousands of American lives and this is war and this is what you do in war in order to save your soldiers. Yes, I mean, I think uh, it's, fair, it's very clear now that the atomic bomb was totally unnecessary. Uh, the reason I say that is the intelligence studies, which were available to the president in July of 1945, the bomb was used in August, said very clearly that when the Russians entered the war in Japan, and we had asked them to come help, and they were about to help the first week of August, that's the date they were supposed to come in, when that happens, this will precipitate a collapse and a crisis in Japan. They're already trying to get out of the war. They know they can't face the Russian army and us. That will end the war. The only thing you need to do is be sure to say you're not going to harm their emperor because he's a god in their culture. And if you give that kind of assurance when the Russians come in, the war is over. American policy leaders understood that. They know that. Every historian who studied it knows these documents are now available. So they had it available. And more, more important than that, the invasion, which might have cost 25,000 lives, 30,000, that's the estimates, it was later exaggerated to a million, couldn't take place for another three months because of the weather and because of getting troops. So it was easy to test whether or not the intelligence was correct. The Russians were coming in, and we knew they were going to, everyone said it, the war was going to end. That was a top military understanding. And they used the bomb anyway. So I think that's it. the story is pretty clear now. Most historians know the bomb was unnecessary. There's a big debate about why it was used. Well, that was my next question. So if it's, if it's to make a political point, what's the point? Well, the, the documents are less clear about this. We, but what it looks to be, there are many, many documents that say, look, this is going to give me a hammer on those boys, meaning the Russians. That's the president talking. Another one says this is the mess. Yeah, this is Truman. Truman. His Secretary of War says, this is the master card of diplomacy against the Russians, the atomic bomb. There are many, many documents that strongly suggest, particularly the Secretary of State, James Burns, understood that the bomb was more a diplomatic tool than a, a military tool. Um, the, chief of, the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army and the Combined Chiefs, General Marshall, said this is not a military decision. It has nothing to do with the military. It's maybe a diplomatic, political other kind of decision, but has, it's not a military decision. So interestingly, the military, I, I mentioned this, I think, in our last discussion, virtually all the major American military leaders went public after the war saying the atomic bomb was totally unnecessary. Some called it barbaric. The president's chief of staff went public. Can you imagine the chief of staff saying, and a good, he was a good friend of the president, said, this is barbarism. I wasn't taught to kill children and w women. So that's very clear. The strongest evidence is, and you can't prove this with the available documents, that was mainly aimed at the Russians because there was, they wanted to use it as political pressure and political weapon, both in Eastern Europe and in Asia where the, the, the Cold War really was starting. And, and even though uh, the Americans had been asking the Russians to get involved in Japan for a long time, it must have not been something they wanted. The Russians win the war with Japan. That would not be a headline they would like to see. Right. And indeed, they wanted them in because the bomb was a theory until it was tested. Might not work. Who knew? And how well would it work? 
So they were begging the Russians to come in. Then the instance it, it, worked, it worked, they went ahead and used it. Moreover, the, they had planned to give em, the emperor assurances that, so that they could end the war quickly. And as soon as the bomb worked, they took that out of the documents too, that they, they, they asked the Japanese to surrender, made a big propaganda thing, but they took out the key point that, that we wouldn't harm their, their emperor god. And everyone knew if you did that, they would keep fighting forever. So it's not a very, it's a very a, a unpleasant story about American diplomacy, to say the least. Yeah, and, and, and the, the psyche and the, and the potential sociopathy of the presidency and, 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 and the opening of, of decades of Cold War yep. that brought, often brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. Yep, it was, it's, it's the beginning of it all. Now, the thing that, that I think is important to understand because these people were ordinary human beings, the president, his secretary of state. They were not evil guys. They were caught up in an ideology that somehow if we followed American strategy, we could save the world from another war and the Russians are, they believed, communist devils. So they were operating out of a framework of ideology that dominated their thinking to the extent that 300,000 civilians were burned unnecessarily, killed. So, but it's a mistake to see them just as bad guys. Much more important is how does, how does American corporate capitalism develop that ideology? And what does it really take to reach much deeper than, than good guys and bad guys? There's a great deal of detail one can get into on this, but, but and, 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 and as I say, we're gonna get into kind of other themes in the rest of the interview. But one part of this I think is important because you can see it show up again and again in other examples. Your book established things fairly definitively, uh, and since there have been other books that have established and reinforced your findings, there have been other research. Uh, as you say, I think most historians that have studied this have come to the same conclusion, that this, the bomb wasn't necessary to end the war. The mass media narrative, the educational narrative, is the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Every, any article that talks about this talks about the bomb saved American lives and such and such. The, the, this, the, your entire critique is as if it never happened mm -hmm. in most mass media. Mass media is true. Some, they're now having, I get high school in, inquiries all the time from students who are being asked to write papers about this. And they're being given, they wouldn't get to me unless they were being given my research materials and so forth. So in various parts of the country there's something going on. Uh, and particularly the younger generation. But the mass media, except for one program done by ABC that I happened to work with and consult with Peter Jennings before he died, opened up this issue just once. And this is the media just knowing that their job is to make sure the, the American narrative is not questioned, the official narrative doesn't get challenged? I think, I think what happens... Are they ignorant of, what, of the work? I partly mean. ignorant. I think what really happens is there are right-wing historians who, of course, disagree, and they write big, long books. And here's another book, this, even though this is the common view in many parts of the world now, outside the United States. The media people are caught between this guy and that guy, and they take the cautious road. They, they don't know enough of them. They don't want to make the judgments. They don't want to dig deep enough into it. But it's it. also partly not wanting to believe that your president I, is capable of such a thing. I think so. Yes, that's part of it as well. I mean, I, I remember having a, a discussion debate with a relative of mine at, at, just before the Iraq war. And, and, and I was saying there is simply no evidence of weapons of mass destruction. Just listen to Hans Blix. He's mm -hmm. saying there's nothing there. Blix keeps saying, right. if you know where they are, tell me, I'll go find them. And, and he, you know, this relative looks me in the eye and says, there is just no way I can believe that my president knowingly would start a war based on a lie. As much as he didn't like Bush, he votes Democrat. He right. just couldn't believe. That's right. I think that is true. That, I, I think you put your finger on something. It's very hard to believe that people would have actually done this uh, it, because it is such a brutal and vicious thing to do. It, it goes further. And here's how, here's, this is what really caught me up. After the atomic bombs were used, after the Japanese had surrendered publicly, Radio Tokyo, but before their formal papers had passed, the war was over. The United States ordered, the president ordered, the largest bombing raid in world history, 1,400 bombers, did more damage than probably Hiroshima. But the sense that people would actually do that, I remember 
putting that on my mirror when I shaved in the morning. I just couldn't believe it either. That and how do the right-wing historians rationalize this? They, they just ignore it. It's just ignored. This idea that my president could never do such a thing, it's a narrative that, that's so protected. I, I, you must know the example of, uh, it came out in the Johnson tapes, that Nixon had deliberately scuttled Johnson's negotiations with the North Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And Johnson was very close to a, an end of the Vietnam War. And Nixon sends an emissary to the North Vietnamese saying, if you sign with Johnson, I'm the next president. I'm not going to go along with, with the agreement. Mm -hmm. But I will make the deal with you. And so the North Vietnamese don't make the deal with Johnson. And of course, Nixon doesn't make the deal. And tens of thousands of Americans are killed, but hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese and Cambodians. Yeah. And, uh, and, and same thing. I mean, people say, well, could would a president of mine really deliberately do such a thing? Yeah. And the answer is, yeah. Yeah, it is in, in, in case by case. Some of them would, some, and some of them believing it was the right thing to do. I mean, that's Truman. Truman thought he was doing good, not bad. Mm. So that's the, see, that's what gets really, they actually do it. It's very hard to believe. And then how did they rationalize? But, but, he, but Truman worked, you know, he's, he's Roosevelt's vice president. Roosevelt says we can work with the Russians. Yeah. Roosevelt did work with the Russians. There's a whole culture uh, of, of, you know, even with, I mean, Wallace is on the outs by then, who was, had previously been uh, Roosevelt's vice president. But, I mean, it wasn't such a, no. you know, but we had not gotten yet to McCarthyism and, and, and such, you know, Truman didn't have to go there, but they, there's a very deliberate attempt to create this hysteria. Yes, well, Truman was, Truman was very different from Roosevelt from the beginning. I mean, during the war, he publicly, in the Senate, made a speech saying, what we should do is aid the Russians until they, so they can kill more of the Nazis and aid the Nazis to kill the Russians. I mean, he had a very different mentality, and his Secretary of State had a different mentality. The whole Roosevelt crew was dumped out as soon as Roosevelt died. And that mentality came into office. It took them a long while to bring the country with them on lots of issues. It took them two or three years to really get the country behind them because the country didn't buy that. That was not accepted. Now, you're talking about the role of the media and kind of keeping to this official narrative. I saw in the New York Times just the other day, uh, there's a story about Syria. Hmm. And there's a paragraph in the article, Syria have, having used chemical weapons, dot, 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 dot. Now, as far, unless I missed something here, there is still no evidence that who, that the Syrian government used the chemical weapons. Now, I'm fully could believe that they could. I have no great illusions about Assad and the Syrian government. But as far as I know, there's no evidence. And in fact, there's lots of evidence that it might have been uh, somewhere on the opposition side right. that used them. But it's just, it's that paragraphs in the article, the Syrian government used chemical weapons, ba -ba 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 -ba, <laughs> and it becomes the narrative. Yes. yes, it does. I mean, on these issues, it's the easy way to go for the press is to that, go that direction rather than to dig and, and oppose the conventional wisdom or the presidential. And, and that gives them access if you start raising questions. Seymour Hirsch has been having trouble because he's trying to raise these issues. That, you know, the great investigative journalist is now having trouble getting some of his things out and he's publicly going to using the London book re review of books. It's still the echo of the Cold War, isn't it? Like, like if you get off the official narrative, then what's your agenda? Yeah. You know, you've got your own political agenda. <laughs> and, uh, you know, th th there's still this, you know, kind of Cold War mentality. Yeah, and, and journalists wanting to protect their access to, to key people in the government who they need, they think, to get their stories rather than to dig, dig, dig. Um, it's best not to raise certain issues. Right. Okay, we're going to move on now to the next segment uh, where we're going to look at this, I, what Gar's been spending most of his time for the last few years working on, which is what would a new economy look like and what would America after capitalism look like and also how do we get there? So please join us for the next segment of Reality Asserts Itself with Gar Alpovitz on the Real News Network.